morning. You'll remember last week we left Joseph just sold to the Ishmaelites on his way to Egypt. This week, Pastor Kenny will continue a series on Jesus in Genesis with chapters 39 through 42 as we see Joseph once again continuing to persevere through adversity and eventually the prophecy of his brothers bowing before him fulfilled. We're going to be working through chapters 39 through 42, and I'm sure you'll be upset to hear that I won't be reading the entirety of these chapters. But as we uh, go through these, I don't think uh, John will be able to keep up as good as he is. I'm going to be starting with chapter 39, verses 1 through 6. This is where Joseph is uh, initially succeeding in Egypt. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him, and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight, and became his personal servant, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he owned he put in his charge. It came about that from the time he made him overseer in his house, and over all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned, in the house and in the field. So he left everything he owned in Joseph's charge, and with him there he did not concern himself with anything, except the food which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And now we're going to skip ahead to verse 23 of the same chapter where Joseph is now in jail. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. We're now going to chapter 40, going to verses 20 through 23, where he has interpreted some fellow prisoners' dreams, and we see the results of that, starting with 20. Thus it came about on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his office, and he put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, just as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. On to chapter 41, reading verses 14 through 16, as Joseph is asked to interpret the Pharaoh's dreams. Then Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph, and they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, but no one can interpret it. And I have heard it said about you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph then answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. We're skipping ahead to verses 38 through 45, where Joseph is given a position of leadership. Then Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom is a divine spirit? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has informed you all of this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and according to your command, all my people shall do homage. And only in the throne will I be greater than you. Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. And then Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put the gold necklace around his neck. He had him ride in his second chariot and they proclaimed before him, Bow the knee. And he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, Though I am Pharaoh, yet without your permission, no one shall raise his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh named Joseph Zephanath Paneah, and he gave him Asenath, the daughter of Panapera, priest of On, as his wife. And Joseph went forth over the land of Egypt. And we'll finish with chapter 42, verses 1 through 7, where he sees his brothers once again. Now Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, and Jacob said to his sons, Why are you staring at one another? He said, Behold, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt, Go down there and buy some for us from that place, so that we may live and not die. Then ten brothers of Joseph went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers. For he said, I am afraid that harm may befall him. So the sons of Israel came to buy grain among those 
who were coming, for the famine was in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was the ruler over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he disguised himself to them and spoke to them harshly. And he said to them, Where have you come from? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray to you that you prepare our hearts and our minds for this sermon, that we may grow in our knowledge and our understanding of you, Lord. And we, prepare, we pray the same thing for those at home, whether it be right now or in the future, that you help settle the anxieties of this world and prepare them to receive your word, Lord. That we may not be distracted by the things that we often think are the point, when really this is the point, Lord. We are made to worship you. We see the example in Joseph that no matter where he was or what he was suffering, that he remained faithful to you with his eyes on you. And when the time came that you had prepared him for, he was ready to act on your behalf, Lord, and save your people through your sovereign plan. Lord, we pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I want to read a passage for you. I want you to think about this as we go through this morning's passage. The scripture says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which also was in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. All right, now let's turn back to Genesis chapter 39. And uh, certainly in the, in the reading, as Eric said, we aren't going to read all of these four chapters, but I try to pick out the passages that will give you the pivotal moments, and then in the message I'll kind of fill in the blanks for you. And I hope that when you get the outline and the uh, email each week that you go ahead and read the scriptures ahead of time. Uh, that's a, a good thing for you to do, to, to be prepared for worship. And, of course, after we go over this morning, you can read them uh, through the coming week as well. And then by Thursday, you'll probably have the next chapters that will be for our consideration next week. So last week, we looked at the beginning of Israel's journey to Egypt. We called it the Road to Egypt Part 1. This week, we are continuing the Road to Egypt as we look at Part 2, and it is the exaltation of Joseph. So we're going to see this pattern which happens for, for Joseph and then for Israel and then for Jesus. Uh, imagine you're, you're Israel, the Israelites, and you're in the wilderness and, and you're going through all of these hardships. And uh, there's been times when you didn't have anything to eat, nothing to drink, uh, just, just oppression from enemies and all these fears and anxieties. And Moses tells you the story of Joseph. And when you hear the story of Joseph, you know that God is in control. And it's the same thing for us. I mean, we're looking here at Genesis, or at Jesus in Genesis, and that is certainly the, the primary point of what we're preaching, but there are a lot of principles in this as well. And we'll talk about some of these morning, especially the principle of God's providence, which we'll see today and highlight it again next week. I told the early service, uh, I hate to wish away my life, especially uh, when I got surgery coming up in two weeks, but I can't wait to get to next week's message anyway. I know next week's going to come anyway, God willing, and, uh, and, and that's just one of my favorite portions uh, of the scripture we'll be looking at next week. But this is an exciting text here, building up to that moment that we'll see next week, God willing. So in the scenes before us today, we see the fall and the exaltation of Joseph. And again, this prefigures the sequence of exaltation, humiliation, and exaltation that is experienced by Joseph, 
and by Israel and ultimately by Jesus himself. Uh, so we're going to begin with Act 2. Uh, this is the uh, part of Book 10 and Scene 1 where Joseph has been so we, 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 we transitioned last week. We saw that his brothers had sold him and we ended chapter 37 with the verse that started with meanwhile. Meanwhile, Joseph is on his way to Egypt. And then there was the chapter about Judah and how Perez came, the descendant of uh, David, which Moses at the time had no idea what was going to happen to that. It reminds me of what uh, Peter tells his writers, that when these men were writing scripture, they were led along by the Holy Spirit and they had to, to look, to see, and to think, what is this about? Because they couldn't see it. Because God was moving them to write the scripture. God is moving Moses to write this scripture before us this morning. And so Moses tells us that Joseph now is in Egypt. And he has been sold to a man by the name of Potiphar, who is a security, who is the, one of the top guys of Pharaoh's bodyguard. And he recognizes, Potiphar recognizes in Joseph a very talented man, a very gifted man. And so in just a short time, Joseph, who is 17 years old, we'll follow a timeline, he's 17 years old when he goes to Potiphar's house, when he's sold into Egypt, in just perhaps a year or two, he is the head of Potiphar's house. And Potiphar doesn't do a thing. He just you know, leaves everything to Joseph's charge. Now, what you didn't hear in the reading, and I hope that you have read it, but don't read it right now, but you can read it when you get home if you have it. But after this happens, we're told that Joseph is a very handsome man, of good form, and Potiphar's wife falls for him. And she tries to seduce him, but she can't. And then one day she sends all the servants out and she tries to assault him. To force him to lie with her, to use the King James euphemism. And he runs away, but she catches a part of his garment. This is just the opposite of Judah, isn't it, from last week? And she screams and accuses him of attempting to assault her, the very thing she was trying to do to him. And he winds up in prison. So can you imagine the roller coaster that, that Joseph is on? I mean, one moment he's, he's in his father's house, he's wearing a royal robe, he's, he's the favorite, and the next minute he's being sold out by his brothers, and he winds up in Egypt, and, and that's terrible. But then he gets a good job in the Potiphar's house. And so here he is back up again. And now, because he tried to be virtuous, and not many people get sent to prison trying to be virtuous, right? But because he's tried to be virtuous and do the right thing, he's sent to prison, falsely accused. And so now he's in prison. And the last part of verse or chapter 39, the Lord, verse 21, the Lord was with Joseph. And, and you see that over and over in these passages. Chapter 39 begins that way. Look at verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord is with Joseph. Even though Joseph is a slave, even though Joseph is a prisoner, the Lord is with him. Beloved, it doesn't matter what your station in life or what your circumstances. If you belong to Jesus Christ, the Lord is with you. He is with you. He has not forgotten you. The Lord was with him. So once again, Joseph's talents and Joseph's gifts are recognized this time by the, by the warden. And so he gives Joseph the the, the job of trustee, the ultimate trustee. He's in charge of everything that happens in the prison. And so in that job, he meets all of the prisoners who comes in. And, and one day, I'm sure there was a stir about this, Pharaoh's 
chief baker and his cupbearer were sent to prison. Now, the chief baker, of course, is over the kitchen of Pharaoh preparing the food, and the cupbearer or the steward or the wine taster is the man who who's, is always in Pharaoh's ear. He, he's like an advisor, but he's an advisor with a special job. Before Pharaoh tastes anything, this man has to taste it first to make sure it's not poisoned. What a job, right? You're working for a guy that a lot of people would like to kill, and, and you're the guy who screens everything he does. But he liked that job. But Pharaoh gets angry with him and throws him in prison. Joseph gets to know them, and one morning... Joseph says, this is in verse 7, chapter 40, he says to them, why are your faces so sad today? And they said to him, we, had, we have had a dream and there is no one to interpret it. So dreams were very important to people in the ancient Near East. In, in a sense, you know, like for us today, sometimes people think dreams are important. I think dreams can be silly. Dreams probably reflect what's going on in your subconscious. And, you know, uh, psychologists and psychiatrists try to analyze dreams to, to get into your subconsciousness, but they weren't dreaming about their subconscious. And they didn't believe that they were dreaming about their subconscious. They believed that their dreams were harbingers or, or predictors of what was to come, things that they needed to pay attention to. And so they had a class of specialists who interpreted dreams. And they used astrological signs and, you know, the entrails of, of dead birds and all kinds of things to figure these dreams out. And so they come to Joseph and they said, we've had this dream and there's no one to interpret it. And Joseph said, do not interpretations belong to God. Now, I told you something last week. All of these brothers, and I think it's important that you keep in mind that these are brothers, Joseph and his brothers. All of these brothers, especially Joseph and Judah, are changing and maturing through the years. And people should. I was talking to a man one time and we, we were just in the Harlem house and sitting at the, at the bar up there, uh, not the, where they serve whiskey, but where they serve coffee. And uh, we were drinking a cup of coffee, having breakfast. And he just started talking to me. He didn't talk a lot, this guy. But he said, he said, Kenny, he said, you know, a man in his 20s, he says, he makes a lot of mistakes. He does a lot of things. He said, and so your 20s, he said, you, you kind of get past your 20s. Hopefully no mistake is going to trip you up. He said, but then you get to your 30s. He said, you start learning things. And by this time, Joseph is in his 30s. Well, then you get to your 40s. And by, your, by the time you're in your 40s, you should have your head pretty much set and your direction set. And by your 50s, things should be coming to fruition. And he said, if you don't get there by your 60s, he said, Kenny, he said, you probably just go home. <laughs> Although there are exceptions to that rule. I always thought I like to finish well, no matter how I start. But Joseph has grown. Can you see that here? He doesn't say like he would have years before this. Hey, I've had a dream. Let me tell you about it. Let me tell you about my dream. Your sheaves will bow down to my sheaves. The, the stars and the moon and the sun will bow down to me. He's lost that arrogance. His judgment has improved. I think his walk with the Lord has improved through adversity. You know, how many of you took Patience 101 in college? Did you take that course? Or, or what about adversity 202? Or, or adversity in masters. Did you take any of that? You didn't take that, did you? Because they don't offer it. Now they try to protect people. We have safe rooms. 
and comfort rooms and comfort zones because we don't want them to have adversity. Heaven, no, because people can learn wisdom in adversity. Huh. Heaven is the, the last thing we want our kids to learn now is wisdom. We want to be smart. But you know something? Smart without experience, without some adversity, don't get you anywhere because it's not wisdom. Wisdom is intelligence guided by experience. I just throw these things in and it don't cost any extra. <laughs> and that's what Joseph has learned. He's learned patience. We'll see that with his brothers. He's, he's learned to pace himself and to, and to say the right thing. And he says to these men, this is of God. Tell me your dreams. Let me help you. He don't want to brag now. He just wants to help them. So the cupbearer, he told his dream. He said, in my dream, there was a vine, and the vine had three branches. It was budding. Its blossoms came out. Its clusters produced ripe grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. I took the grapes. I squeezed them in the Pharaoh's cup. I put the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Joseph said, well, here's the interpretation. Three days, you're going to get out of prison. Pharaoh's going to lift up your head, and you're going to get your old job back. He's not going to be mad with you anymore. Well, the Bible says the chief baker in verse 16 saw that he had interpreted favorably. So he said, well, let me tell you my dream. I had a dream, and on the top of my head were, was a basket with, with baked food. And the birds were eating out of the basket on my head. And I'm sure Joseph's face must have fallen. And the chief baker said, what does it mean? And he said, well, this is what it means. In three days, Pharaoh's going to lift your head up also. And you're going to be hanged. And the birds of the air are going to pick the flesh from your bones. A dishonorable death. In three days... The cupbearer got his job back. In three days, the baker was executed. In all of this, Joseph said to the cupbearer, go back to verse 15, he said, keep me in mind when it goes well with you. Please do me a kindness by telling Pharaoh, I've been, I've been kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews and I've done nothing wrong and I've been put into a dungeon Remember me. But look what it says in verse 23. Yet the chief cupbearer, when he got his job back, did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. You ever had someone forget you? I don't mean just like forget you and not come pick you up at school or at work. I mean just treat you as if you didn't exist. It happens all the time, doesn't it? And the cupbearer, he didn't, he didn't, the, the memory of Joseph wasn't gone. It was just that perhaps he didn't want to upset Pharaoh or remind Pharaoh of a bad time. He didn't want to risk his, you know, refound position by making ways for some Hebrew slave in the prison now. So he doesn't say anything. So then we come to the next act in the next scene. And that is Pharaoh now has a dream in chapter 41, act 2, scene 3. He has a dream. He tells his dream to those who were the interpreters. Remember, there was no interpreters in prison, but there are interpreters in the palace. He says, from the Nile there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, they grazed, in the marsh grass. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them from the Nile, ugly and gaunt. They stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. The ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven sleek and fat cows, and then he awoke. He went back to sleep. He had another dream. The thin ears swallowed up the seven plump ears, or he saw seven plump ears and seven thin ears, and then a scorching east wind came up after them, and the seven plump ears were swallowed up by the seven thin ears, and he awoke again. His spirit is troubled. 
And so he sent for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men, and he told them his dreams, but there was no one that could interpret him. And my, unlike the ones we'll see later on in, in, in Nebuchadnezzar's time, at least you have to give them this on their integrity. They, even, they didn't even try to fake it because they knew if it didn't come true, they were going to be killed anyway. So no one could interpret the dream. And then the wine bearer comes through. Verse 10. So Pharaoh is furious at his servants. Or for everyone, he says, Then the chief, or this is verse 9, Then the chief cupbearer spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I would make mention today of my own offense. There was a time when he threw me in jail. And while I was in jail, I had a dream on that same night along with the baker, each of us dreamed, according to the interpretation of his own dream, a Hebrew youth was in there, a servant of the captain of the bodyguard, and we related to him, and he interpreted our dreams to us. To each one he interpreted according to his own dream, and just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me in my office, but he hanged him. So Pharaoh is desperate to know what his dream means, and so he calls for the Hebrew youth to be brought up out of the prison. So they bring him up hurriedly. But before he can come into Pharaoh's presence, I mean, they don't just rush him out of prison and present him before Pharaoh. He can't stand in Pharaoh's presence, bearded and, and in rags. No, as according to the Egyptian custom at that time, they, they shave him, his beard is gone, his hair is probably cut very, very close. They bathe him, they put on a linen robe, and then he is presented before Pharaoh. And he said to Pharaoh, I've had a dream, and I need the interpretation. I hear that you can interpret dreams. And then Joseph said to Pharaoh the same thing he said to the steward and the baker. It is not in me, God. God will do this. He's always about God, isn't he? And his brothers have probably not had many God-conscious thoughts, maybe not even Jacob, in their last 13 years. But Joseph never forgets God. God never forgets Joseph. God has been preparing Joseph for this moment. Reminds me of another moment that is spoken of a lot. Jesus would say many times, wouldn't he? Not my hour. My hour has not yet come. So Joseph is humiliated. He goes through this spiraling descent for years, 13 years, and now his moment has arrived. Pharaoh tells him his dream, the two dreams, and Joseph says to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, his dreams are, this is verse 25, are one and the same. God has told Pharaoh what God is going to do. And so he says, there's going to be seven good years, represented by the seven good years, good cows, the seven good ears, and then there's going to be seven bad years, represented by the lean and ugly cows, and the thin ears, and the scorching east wind. It is spoken to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do, seven years of abundance, seven years of famine, so all the abundance will be unknown in the land because the subsequent famine for it will be very severe. God is going to bring this about quickly Pharaoh you better get ready 
And Pharaoh is astonished. He says to his servants in verse 38, Can we find a man like this with the Spirit of God in him? Reminds you of another man, doesn't it, years later. You see, I know this. The world may not always like it, but the world recognizes, recognizes people who have the Spirit of God, who have that disposition. And in those words, not, not the words that, you know, they point to the, when they score a touchdown and put their finger in there. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people of spiritual discernment and spiritual judgment and a spiritual disposition. Who display the, the fruit of the Spirit. I'm sure Pharaoh must have marveled. Here comes this, this Hebrew, unlearned except for what he's learned in Potiphar's house and in the prison, and yet he not only interprets the dream, but the solution he proposes, everyone can see it is the right thing. Reminds me of another Hebrew man. Daniel and his friends. Remember Daniel? Remember Daniel is taken from, from his country by the Babylonians and he's taken to Babylon. And even though he refuses to reject his God or betray his God, he still, there is this spirit of cooperation within him. There is obvious, obviously wisdom in him. And, and Nebuchadnezzar knows it. And later on, Belshazzar knows it. The world recognizes it, even though Joseph's brothers didn't. And then there was another man. And when he was on trial, his judge said to him, I find no fault in this man. And his executioner said, this is the son of God. The world could see, even though the world doesn't necessarily belong, doesn't necessarily at this point bow the knee, the world could see what the brothers of Jesus could not. John said he came into his own, and his own refused him. They, they, they rejected him. As Joseph has been rejected by his brothers, as Joseph has been humiliated, as Jesus was humiliated, but now the hour has come, and after the hour is over, the hour of crisis, now comes exultation. So Pharaoh says, there's no one like Joseph in all the land. So, I'm going to put you second in charge. You're going to be the vizier. You're going to be the prime minister. I've set you over all the land of Egypt. The only one you're not above is me. He gives him a signet ring. Clothe him in garments of fine linen. Put a gold necklace around his neck. And had him ride in the chariot. And they proclaim before him, bow the knee. Bow the knee. Here comes Zaphnath Paniah. Bow the knee. He's the savior of the world. And he will be the savior of his people in a different way. Thirteen years have passed, and he's gone from slave to second in charge. Pharaoh gives him a wife, Asenath. She bears him two sons, and he gives them Hebrew names. And just as Moses had no idea what the outcome of Judah would be, he had no idea what the outcome of Manasseh and Ephraim would be. Because you see, 
when the land is divided, and Moses did know this, but he didn't know the significance of it. He did know that Joseph did not get a portion. Joseph got a double portion. In the 12 tribes, you don't, you don't name Joseph. You name Ephraim and Manasseh. And so here he is, exalted, because God is going to fulfill the prophecy that he made to Abraham in Genesis 15, and because God has a plan of redemption, and because God is foreshadowing his ultimate plan of redemption, all of this is going on. And Joseph has no idea And neither do we. In the midst of our lives, we have no idea sometimes what the outcome will be, do we? We don't. And that brings us to chapter 42, to Jacob. We're told at the end of chapter 41 that the famine was spread over the face of the earth. Joseph opened the storehouses. I love that. Sold to the Egyptians, and the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. The people of all the earth came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph. And now Jacob, sitting back in Canaan, his ten sons around him. <laughs> Did you see the picture? Now, Usually when we see these boys, what are they doing? In the, in the last chapter, we saw them off at Shechem pasturing the sheep. Because the Bible tells us Jacob had large flocks and herds. We see Judah in chapter 38 going to shear his sheep. They're always in action. They're always moving something about the flocks. And now as chapter 42 opens, they're standing there looking at each other, and Jacob says to them, why are you standing here looking at each other? Why do you think they'd be standing there looking at each other? Why aren't they out tending the herds? Because the herds are about gone. When a famine comes, first thing that goes, I hate to tell you this, Carly, first thing that goes is animals. The food goes to the people. People die last. I said that to Carly because Carly can watch a movie and people can be getting slaughtered left and right, but as long as animals are okay, it's okay. <laughs> Behold, I've heard there's grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us from that place so that we may live and not die. Here's a theme of the Bible. It's a theme in Genesis. It's a theme of the Bible. So that you will live and not die. And notice this too about Jacob. He doesn't sit there and say, well, God is sovereign, so we'll just sit here and, and, and maybe in a little while, you know, quail will start falling from the sky and, and, and manna might start falling from the sky. He doesn't say that, does he? Even though God is sovereign, Jacob has to do something. And he's heard there's grain in Egypt. When you hear about the source of life, beloved, you need to attend to it. You need to attend to it. I'm talking here about spiritual life. Just as Jacob, you know, isn't it an amazing thing Joseph said to Pharaoh? He said to Pharaoh, he said, you know something, God has done a really neat thing for you here. He's shown you what he's going to do. And there is nothing greater that, a, that God can do for a person in this world than to show them and to wake them up one day and say, this is where you are and this is where life is. When you hear that and you see where life is and life is in Christ, you need to attend to it. You need to attend to it. So he says to his sons, he says, I want you to go to Egypt and get us some food so that we can live. I want you ten boys to go, but I'm not going to send Benjamin. Benjamin is Joseph's full brother. 
When he was born, Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel, died. And in her death, she said of her son, Ben Omi, son of my travail. But Jacob changed his name. You realize he's the only son that Jacob names. Of all of his boys, he names this one. He changes his name from Ben Omi to Ben um, with an A. And it changes from son of tribulation to son of my right hand. This is my boy. This is the apple of my eye. Joseph is gone. Now he's my favorite. Now you notice something else too. The ten brothers, they don't raise a stir about this, do they? I think they've grown a little bit too. Even though I think maybe you could say, well, they're just used to being treated like field hands. Maybe so. So they go to Egypt to buy grain. And this gets to one of my favorite parts. They come in, and I'm sure Joseph has told his guys, he said, now, if you ever have any Hebrews coming here, let me know. Because there's, a, you know, there's things you've got to read between the lines. If there's ever any Hebrews here, you let me know. So his assistant comes to him and he says, Joseph, there's 10 guys out here. They're Hebrews. They're from Canaan. They want to buy grain. Joseph says, okay, bring them in. They come in and they stand before Joseph. And what do they do? And Joseph remembered the dream. Now, what will Joseph do? What will he do? What would you do? Man, these guys did you bad. Well, you could say, well, it turned out okay. Yeah, but still. These are, these are just bad guys. I cried out. They didn't listen to what I said. They just sold me. They would have killed me. And now, just like I was shown. Now remember, he's learned these dreams come from God. He's not saying just as I predicted. Now his thought process, God showed me this. God showed me this. And God showed me this for a reason. So vengeance is not for me, but we're going to make sure things are right. So he gives them some reminders without them even knowing it. First thing he says to them, he treats them harshly. He treats them harshly, but he never harms them. He never harms them. He says, you guys are spies. And they said, we're not spies. Now, why would he say that? You think back to chapter 37. What was it, verse 2 or verse 3? I wrote it in my margin. 37.2. When they were angry because Joseph had gave, given a bad report about them to their father. He's a spy. So Joseph says, you men, you men are spies. No, we're not spies. We're, we're honest men. <laughs> and Joseph is saying to himself, we'll see. We'll see. So here is Joseph, exalted. His brothers have come. They're right where he wants them. What will he do? Well, you can read this for yourself, and then we'll go over it next week. 
But you know this, he's going to do what God has planned for him to do from before the foundation of the world. Joseph is going to deliver these men. Just as Christ delivered us when we were his enemies. He forgave us and gave us life so that we might live and not die. Let's stand for prayer. Oh Lord, we once again, it's just... I pray this every week, but it's so true. We stand amazed in your presence. And and we look at this mystery. It was such a mystery for Joseph, such a mystery for Jacob, as as we will see next week if you allow us to come back and, and gather around this word again. Things that were so dark for them, And yet, in the darkness, you were there. In our darkness, before we ever came to know you, you were there. You never forgot us and you never will because we are emblazoned upon your hands, embedded. You cannot forget us. We are ever before your face. Lord, as individuals, as your church, we are redeemed. We live. And my prayer this morning is for us as your people to to rejoice in who you are and to rejoice in your sovereignty and in your providence. Even though there are times in our lives when it does not suit us, yet you are still in control and even though sometimes it looks as if things are going in the wrong direction, Lord, you have determined the destination. And so wherever we are, Lord, remind us that this is not the goal, this is just part of the process that is being used to take us to the ultimate goal. And all along the way, we, we grow and we learn and we are becoming more and more discerning and more and more tenderhearted towards each other because we love you so much because of what you've done for us. And I pray for those who have not come to Christ. I pray that even now... Holy Spirit, that you might open their hearts and their minds and show them where there is spiritual life and move them that they might come and receive Christ by faith and live forevermore. Live in a way they've never lived before where they would have true life, eternal life. And all of this we pray would be for your glory that people would know that, that you are here, that you are in us as your people. They would see you as they saw you in Joseph, as they saw you in Daniel, as they saw you in Jesus. May they see you in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Isn't this a wonderful, wonderful study? It just... I just can't tell you how exciting it is to read God's Word each week and to read it as if I've never read it before. And I pray that if you're here this morning and, and you're a believer that, there goes the, I think that's the fire thing. I can't help that and I don't think you can either. Maybe you did. Sorry, I short-changed you. Anyway, uh, what was I? Oh, I know. 
If you're here and you're a believer, I just pray that you would rejoice in this. And that you would say, you know, I want my light to shine before people in this world that they might see Jesus in me. And if you're here or, or you've watched online and you don't know Christ, oh, beloved, I implore you, come to him, trust in him, and have life, and life forever. And the people said, Amen. Hope to see you tonight at 6 o'clock for the panel. Thanks.